Uh, my name is Harold Matson. Uh, as a boy, I never liked the name Harold. The only person that called me Harold was my mother. Uh, my nickname is Matt. Harold Matt Matson. Uh, high school, it was Matts, but they dropped the S when I got uh, of age, I guess you'd say, which is high school. Uh, I was uh, born in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, to uh, parents who emigrated from Finland. And uh, as a young child, they moved to Chicago for employment reasons for my father. And uh, I was, uh, have said and uh, told everyone that I was, I was raised in Chicago and I am a Chicagoan at heart, baseball and all. Uh, I lived there until um, I went into the service. The um, war broke out in 1942. I was in the high school class of Steinmetz High School in Chicago uh, in the year of 1942 class. And uh, uh, when I got out of high school, Everybody scattered. The guys went to the service, but I wasn't old enough yet. Age 17 was uh, when I got out, and uh, the uh, 18 was the age for getting into the service. So after I got out of high school, uh, it was hard to leave because I enjoyed high school immensely. Uh, I enrolled at the University, University of Illinois in Champaign, Illinois, and uh, uh, stayed there for a year before I got called up into the draft. I tried to enlist in the Air Corps and in the Navy, and I was uh, turned down on both of them because of color blindness. Uh, I went, uh, uh, I actually went into the Army in July of 1943 and uh, then was uh, physically drafted in uh, August of the same year. 30 days, you get 30 days leave before they actually take you to where you're going. So from Fort Sheridan, Chicago, I was taken by train to the middle of no place in Texas. Uh, the siding they dropped the car off in, the, the railroad car off in, was in the northern part of Texas, what might now be called Texas Hills or something like that, probably uh, well developed, but at that time it was open area. Didn't know where in the world we were. We were met at the train station by uh, one of the One of the officers, or uh, probably a, uh, a ranked uh, uh, enlisted man, we were taken to a bus and uh, uh, driven to a place called Camp Swift, Texas. It's a. Uh, it was designed and made in, into a training camp for uh, soldiers, specifically for World War II. I found myself in a, uh, 
in a unit that they called a branch of the chemical warfare and it was known as it was being organized uh, at that time having only members of the cadre there who were previously in a Italian size units and uh, it was called the 86th Chemical Mortar Battalion. Now when people are told I was in the 86th Chemical, they thought I was in a white apron somewhere in a laboratory, but this was about as far from that as you can get. The our main uh, uh, our main weapon was halfway secret, and we were not to speak about it. Uh, it was called a 4.2 inch chemical mortar, which is a large mortar and rifled on the inside of the barrel so that you could get accurate uh, uh, shell fire. It um, had been used in Africa and very successfully, but there was, I think, only one battalion at that time of chemical mortar. We, uh, we were formed in haste. They needed it badly in Europe, even though the European war was still in the paper, paper, paper process. I really thought that basic training was fun. I was just 18 years old. I was really uh, rather immature as far as that goes. But uh, at 18, I, I knew very little, hadn't been anywhere, and uh, uh, was quite pleased to get in with a mix of people. Our unit consisted of draftees from one-third from the Chicago area, one-third from Pennsylvania mining area, and the other one-third from New Orleans and surrounding areas. The unit, as I say, was mobilized in August of 40. 1943, and in six months they had us ready to go overseas. It was a strong, short training program, but it did include chemical gases just in case that a chemical war ever broke out, they had something to fall back on. So we were exposed to uh, several poison gases, the smells, the feel, the uh, uh, performance and so on. and. Uh, it uh, was quite an experience. If any of you people have ever been into tear gas, you'll know the feeling of poison gases, but these kind drop people very quickly. And uh, thank God we never had to use them because neither the enemies uh, went into any kind of chemical warfare that we know about. 
I was a gunner on the mortar. Mortar consisted of three people, a gunner, an ammunition man, and a squad leader. And uh, uh, I was a gunner and my job was to put the shell into the muzzle of the mortar and it, uh, it was a little complicated. It had a built-in shotgun shell. It hit a striker pin. The striker pin and the more the shotgun shell ignited uh, plastic uh, uh, explosives TNT in the barrel and propelled the mortar out uh, on the rifled uh, inside of the barrel. Uh, my job was to pull the cotter pin, drop the shell, and duck my head because it's coming right back at me. We were very valuable. We supported a number of units, probably 40 different units, and everybody was hollering for chemical mortars. Uh, they wanted support for the infantry, uh, at short range artillery and our, our range was from a hundred yards to a mile and depending on how much TNT we put on the uh, end of the uh, shell before we dropped it into the barrel. So uh, we moved from one division to another division to a, a uh, third one or a company of somebody else that needed the help and uh, we felt that they made us feel we were winning the war and nobody had ever heard of us. We covered all four campaigns in Europe <coughs> beginning with the Normandy campaign. We were sent from America, from New Jersey, to England uh, to await the beginning of the uh, battle for Europe. The D-Day was uh, the name given to it, Operation Overlord. We were billeted in private homes. Our, our unit was billeted in private homes up in Northern England, uh, not too far from Birmingham, but on the sea coast of uh, the Scottish side in a resort area called Port Sunlight. And we had no duties to perform, only stood In the morning stood uh, roll call and then we were on our own the rest of the day. In June we were sent to southern England on a train, one of those little choo-choo trains you see uh, in Britain. Uh, very small engines, but, but enough to power to pull them down to the south of England. And we were uh, waiting for the uh, invasion to begin, to get organized, I suppose you say. There were many, many units down there waiting. Uh, I want to back up for just a minute and tell you that um, the uh, trip from, uh, from New Jersey to England uh, was uh, uh, on a luxury liner, the pride of the Dutch fleet. It was called the New Amsterdam. And there were a number of units and that must have been 5,000 troops on that ship. And the food was ugly, ugly. And uh, nobody uh, really got through without getting seasick. We were dodging submarines all the way over. When we got 
went from south, from Port Sunlight to the south of England and uh, were billeted in our own little pup tents. We put up our half shelters and, and made uh, little tents out of them in the field right next to Stonehenge. But I don't think most of the Louisiana boys knew what Stonehenge was. In fact, I had only barely remembered having spoken about Stonehenge at some time or other. But uh, we stayed in that field for several weeks just playing ball and uh, uh, lounging around and living the life of really uh, carefree soldiers. But when we started to move, I never in my born days would have ever dreamed there were that many soldiers in the south of England. When we left Stonehenge, we lined up on a street in convoy and we stayed in the jeeps and trucks overnight uh, while they were loading us, infantry went around us uh, and we had to wait our turn because they had some kind of order in mind in which the landings were to be made. <clears throat> when we finally got to the docks, we were loaded onto a ship called a Liberty Ship which is made by Kaiser Aluminum out in California. And uh, it was made specifically for troop carriers. Uh, I don't know how many it carried, but uh, the dimensions were somewhat like 600 feet long. Carried maybe, well, I know how many were on it. There were 440 men on the ship. And uh, we went into a convoy of about a thousand ships. There were ships of every design, every nature, uh, anything but warships. They were all troop ships, cargo ships, individual yachts, outboard motors, open boats, and sailboats that have been motorized, and just and it had a perfect formation of about a thousand ships, six across, and uh, I don't know how many that would put deep, but it was uh, like a whole brigade of ships crossing the English Channel on the tw 28th of June. I didn't know it at the time, but we were seven miles from the shore of Normandy Beach when I noticed one of the ships uh, some 500 yards to my left was smoking black smoke. And I commented to the fella I was sitting on the, um, uh, the, the doors so they open, put the heavy equipment into the hold and uh, it's raised about three feet off the main deck, and we were sitting on that, and, and I commented to him about the smoke. And our alarm went off on the ship that there was an air raid in progress. Four aircraft warning the troops on the board, anybody on deck was to go down below. So we had only one companion way where I was, and we lined up to go in. And as we were standing in line and some maybe 50 seconds to a minute later, the Claxton horn changed to a submarine warning. It was a submarine alarm. And we went past a ship that was canted toward us. And had, we could see the crew members pulling a whole, uh, fire hose off of reels and trying to uh, get set to put out a fire that was on the ship. 
And as we went past it, maybe two lengths of ship, nobody went to help either ship. Apparently the instructions were to keep going. As we went two or three lengths past that ship, it was a tremendous explosion, an explosion that you'll never, never want to hear again. We were hit by a torpedo. And I was fortunate I got off that uh, hatch, it's called. I got off the hatch where I'd been sitting and I had been in line. But whoever I was talking to did not get off the hatch. The hatch blew. I blew. I went into the air. I don't know how high I went, but I remember my feet over my head. And I landed on my backpack. We were all packed for invasion and I had 80 pound backpack on my back. Landed on my backpack and that's the last I remember. I told this story to a number of people after the war before I realized that I did not get right up. I was unconscious for five hours while they were taking care of the injured and the dead and trying to, the crew had abandoned the ship captain and all took their uh, lifeboats and abandoned the ship and left the 400 and some soldiers on the ship to ship for themselves. Along with our outfit there was a reconnaissance outfit. There were but none of us knew anything about a ship. What do we do? We're loaded down and all our equipment down below and the ship was sinking and had it stern underwater. When I came to the ship that come al came alongside to uh, catch the jumping soldiers, uh, we had a lieutenant who was uh, doing the uh, orderly evacuation of the ship, one man at a time jumped from our ship, which was sinking, to the open LST that had pulled alongside. He, uh, he had seen me laying on the deck and had one of the fellas push me off to one side because they didn't think I was alive. I was there for so many hours without moving and uh, apparently there were no medics on the board. Uh, but at any rate, we, uh, we got onto the uh, uh, LST and they took the whole, all, all the, the injured and dead and the uh, uh, our company back to England, and I presume that the other company, the other uh, unit, was taken back also because their equipment was also so went to the was on its way to the bottom of the sea. But it turned out that they did not sink; the boat did not go down. Somebody was smart enough to close the doors downstairs and keep the water out from the front of the, the, yes, the front of the boat. We went back over about three weeks later, landed on a, uh, uh, a dock, a floating dock that the uh, uh, Army engineers had built and uh, joined up with the rest of the battalion so that we could be deployed into the uh, peninsula of Normandy. So our first battles came in what's known as hedgerows. 
hedgerows became quite famous in the war because they were ideal for uh, uh, bunkers and they, even some of the 88 shells from the German flat tragedy and the flat trajectory uh, 88s couldn't go through the uh, eight, ten foot bunkers. So the streets wound between the bunkers, between the hedgerows, and uh, we got into our first action uh, someplace around the middle of July. pretty close quarters with the enemy. Uh, the hedgerows were boundary lines for small gardens, more or less, and uh, each one maybe 50 feet. So we were with, probably within 50, 150, 200 feet of the Germans, but we couldn't see them because they were down behind hedgerows also and the hedgerow fighting was very heavy. If you tried to go anywhere, there was generally an anti-tank anti gun at the corner waiting for you. But uh, uh, we got positioned okay. And uh, for the first time, we're under small arms fire. The Germans counterattacked we had never been under fire. My squad leader left. He says, I'm getting out of here and left me and the ammunition guy with the gun. Fortunately, the infantry stopped the counterattack and uh, my captain was came back, I guess, but he never, he never got to the, uh, to the front again. They put him back in rear echelon somewhere, working in the kitchen. But he was fortunate that he did not get court-martialed. We finally broke out of the hedgerows, and, uh, the next battle that we got into was um, uh, the battle that was known as St. Lo, where the Germans put up a fight to protect their uh, Brest Peninsula uh, yeah, installations of uh, uh, submarine pens, submarine factories and uh, uh, very valuable possession. At St. Lo, which was halfway between Normandy and uh, Brest, they put up a terrible battle. But we had a terrible answer for them. The Air Force came to life. I would imagine that all of these bombers, Fine Fortress I think they're called, came from England and it was flight after flight after flight for hours. They did not let up on the Germans. I sat on the edge of my uh, foxhole and the ground trembled as I sat there. Uh, they were, uh, they, they just seemed like there was no end to them. They went, must have gone back and reloaded. I, I, I couldn't tell you that. But it went on all day. And finally, the infantry broke the, the uh, defensive line and we all started moving up so that and when we, when we went through the town 
city, I guess, of St. Lo, there was nothing left. It was it was just rubble, and uh, we saw a lot of planes get hit by any aircraft. We got a lot of them. Saw a lot of them fall. A lot of them explode when they hit the ground. Uh, a lot of parachutes come out, and I don't know what their losses were, but it was pretty heavy. Uh, we. Uh, proceeded down to cut the German line from Brest back, uh, from France back to Germany. They, most of the German troops uh, went east back to Germany. Many of them went west and took refuge in the city of Brest, which was a major port city. And I wish you could have seen the accommodations that the German officers had in the city of Brest. Near the shore, the city of Brest is nothing but a stone, a whole high stone. This had been hollowed out from the street level. It was probably three stories high by our standards. And the uh, stone had been hollowed out at street level and doors put in and rooms built and first class headquarters for officers of the German armies. They had carpeting on the floor, pictures on the walls, desks, offices. It was impossible to, for bombs to get to them from the air. I'm sure that they were bombed many times. But when we went in there, we thought they had been living the life of Riley because nobody could touch them, but they did surrender. Well, from there, we went on, on, on to an island where the Germans had moved. It also was all stone. It was called St. Malo, and we bombarded that island for several days with artillery and our guns. And uh, uh, finally they surrendered. And uh, one of our officers, whom I didn't even know we had, our legal officer, uh, accepted their surrender and uh, uh, we became famed by accepting the surrender of St. Malo. After those two battles were over, we thought we'd get a rest, but there wasn't any rest for the wicked people. We. Uh, uh, were immediately convoyed across France back to the Eastern Front where the Germans had control. The trip from Brest to the Eastern Front could have been done in one day, but we didn't have a destination or an assignment. So we stopped five miles short of the front and uh, set up bivouac in an apple orchard uh, in a town near Nancy, France. This is our company only, Company B. The rest of them went on somewhere else. This is what I say. We one one hand didn't know what the other was doing, but the others went on. <laughs> Company B went dug dug a trench for garbage and set up a, a dinner for the evening. The evenings were long at that time. Daylight till ten o'clock.
about the time evening uh, it began getting dusk an announcement came over the PA system which somebody had set up that all the troops here Company B would be at the front tomorrow and today this evening they are to turn in all weapons that were not uh, SOP with the standard operations with them. If you had any enemy guns, enemy souvenirs, enemy knives, you would to turn them in tonight. Well, that didn't go over very well with the boys who had souvenirs to take home, and I was one of them. Uh, I had a revolver that was issued to the British troops. Um, several of us decided to hell with it. We're not going to turn that stuff in. We've been carrying it now for three weeks. Uh, take it to town and we'll sell it. So four of us took off. It was myself, uh, Sergeant Sauer, who later but received a field commission, uh, a uh, Corporal Stoller from Washington, Sauer was from Pennsylvania, and uh, uh, my sidekick, who was the uh, The laughing stock of the company, you might say. He was the the least liked by officers, and he hated the officers the most. We got a half a mile away, and it was just getting dusk, and there was an explosion behind us. And uh, of course, we heard it and felt it. It was a large explosion. We didn't know what happened. And uh, uh, it was a, a lull. We went back to walking again, and we waited about two minutes at the most, maybe a minute and a half. And then suddenly there were nine more large explosions. And Zeke said, hey, that sounds like it's coming from where the guys are. We couldn't tell from our viewpoint, and we st he started running back to the road we had just taken. So we all ran back with him, and sure enough, we were being bombarded by a railroad gun, which was, we were far enough back, we didn't think there was any likelihood that we could get involved in, in being shelled. But a railroad gun will carry for miles. And we had not dug in. Nobody told us to dig in. The guys that were there in the orchard caught hell. We happened to be away from them. They, they caught hell. They dove into the garbage pit, into the latrine pits that had been dug whatever they could find to find cover on. One of my best friends was killed there at that point. Several guys were hurt and wounded, and we took quite a beating on the equipment. The jeeps were hit. Coming up the road was our company executive officer, blood on his shirt, driving a jeep held for leather, he said, have you guys seen an aid station up this way? I said, none of us either had. So we went down and everybody was pouring out of the orchard in jeeps or trucks or whatever they could get in and heading for an alternate uh, position that already had been established. So uh, we were instructed by Patton to oh, 
that we found, or they found out, I didn't know this, but they found out that the Germans were massing a great number of troops to try to cut the British troops and the American contact in two so that they, they couldn't, I, I don't know what the, you know, what the military tactics were, but the Germans were massing a great number, I think a hundred divisions, uh, to split the, the British and the American troop emplacements. Uh, we, our company was assigned to the Hurtgen Forest, and we didn't know what for until we were there for a week or 10 days and we didn't move, we were dug in. Finally found out our purpose was to protect a dam for a river that we were alongside of. The river rang alongside of us and then there was a dam that protected the valley of um, uh, Cologne from uh, flooding and they, if the Germans failed in their attempt to split the, the British and the Americans, they were going to blow that dam and flood the Cologne Plain so that the troop, tank troops could not move through it. Well, we were in that forest of Hurtgen for 30 straight days. No uh, time off. Of course, we didn't have any time off up till then. We were just jumping from one place to another. But we were in that forest of 30 day for 30 days. Zeke and I were in the same um, slit trench, foxhole, whatever you want to call it. And he was so funny. His humor just kept me going the whole time I was there. He went down to guard duty one night and didn't know what a 50 caliber machine gun was that he, he said, how am I supposed to guard the place if they don't tell me what this is? Fired that damn thing. He didn't even know where he was firing. And the officers, the officer today came running down and said, what are you firing at? He said, Zeke said, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know it was gonna fire. And the officer, said, you don't want to give our position away. Well, we been talking with the Germans across the river for two weeks already. <laughs> I don't know why he thought they were hidden. But um, after, uh, after a, a, a messy 30 days, it was really bad. It rained, snowed, we were in, the, we were in mud. If we had to fire anything, which we did occasionally, the guns would sink into the ground. We couldn't fire accurately. It was a it was an ugly, ugly battle. We caught mortar fire every day from the Germans, small mortars, and uh, we fired. Um, WP had a personnel shells at them. Uh, maybe once, twice a week. That's about all we did. Uh, but we, um, uh, the, the, the Battle of Hurtgen Forest was actually considered a, uh, one of the worst of the, uh, of the war, although I failed to see that myself. I guess it was because I was with a funny man. <laughs> but we uh, got orders one day to, um, to get ready to move. And that night before, the night after we got the orders, I heard tanks moving. I knew Patton had arrived. And tanks were moving in and around and into position for the next day's battle. And they had a tank battle. We could hear the tank guns we were firing also smoke to try to cover it, but they covered our own tanks as well as the G 
German tanks, and German tanks were stronger, more maneuverable, had higher uh, uh, gun power than ours, and we took a beating. And then we were told to move out of the forest. Thank goodness. When we moved out of that forest into the air open area where the gun, where the tank battle had occurred, the tanks were still smoking. There were some were burning. There were American soldiers dead. There were German soldiers dead. And we walked, we moved right on past them, except for our dumb driver, Smokey. Lemoyne and one of the backcountry boys from Louisiana who could really drive, but that's all he could do. He muttered, he didn't talk. And he drove, stopped the Jeep suddenly, jumped out, went over to a German soldier laying on the ground, reached in his inside of his, he had a large coat on, inside of his coat pocket, put something in his pocket, jump back in the Jeep and start driving again to catch up with the other boys. I said, Smokey, what the hell did you get out of that? He showed, showed me it was a billfold of his, he was an officer, and this was his billfold, and he show, showed me, here's what I got, and he, boof, full of German money, we don't, I think German money was valueless to us. But he, in the front of his billfold, he had a picture of a beautiful woman walking with a small child in a suburban setting. And for some reason, it changed my whole attitude toward the war. I said, we're fighting people that are just as peaceful as they can be. The little child looking up at the woman all dressed up like they'd been in church. And uh, I, 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 did, I don't know what it did to me, but it did something inside of me that made me feel differently toward the war. But we went on and we went to the little town of Hurtgen where we were told to stop and set the guns up. Because we want, I guess they wanted the heavier artillery brought up also. I'm not sure why. But we stopped in that little town and uh, set the guns up. And uh, I was in the first gun position of the first platoon, and they asked me to fire a, a shot for the forward observer to see where it went. He should have known where it went, but he didn't. He wanted to see. I fired that shot, and uh, just as a shell hit the bottom, an explosion occurred behind me. By the way, we were under shell fire from both sides, it was, you know, way over our heads and then firing toward the backs of the uh, two sides. But there was an explosion behind me. It knocked me backwards into the gun, and it knocked me down, but I fell against the gun. And uh, I heard somebody say, is everybody all right? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm all right. And I stepped out of the gun pit, which was not very deep. We had dug it in maybe 12 inches, 15 inches, something like that. And I dug it in, I mean, I stepped out, and when I took my first step, my leg collapsed. My right leg collapsed. Came out of the socket at the knee, apparently. Came out sideways, and the foot turned back the wrong way. 
I guess I screamed. Somebody start hollering for medics. They said, well, he didn't have any medics here. They all had gone ahead. My squad leader said, just leave him there. I'll take care of it. He said, I know how to do this. And I didn't know what in the world he was talking about. He didn't say, he never had said much, and I didn't have much conversation with him. He said, two of you guys grab a hold of Matt at the, at the shoulders, hold him, and I'll take this leg. He took that leg, twisted it, turned it, pulled it as hard as he could, and it snapped right back in place. I said, how'd you know how to do that? Well, I was hurt, I didn't say it right away, but I asked him how he knew how to do that. He said, I've been an Eagle Scout for eight years. And he was a uh, Jewish boy. I didn't know that at the time. But uh, he had put my knee back in place. And of course it swelled immediately. I couldn't do anything. The boys carried me in. To, we were in the backyard of a home that had been damaged by shell fire. And he, the boys put me in the basement, the cellar of that at home, and parked me up against the wall because they had a firing mission to do. I fell asleep. And I must have slept through the night because it was still dark and somebody woke me up and said, Matson, we're gonna have to leave you. We're moving out. They told us we're moving up again. I said, you can't leave me here. No, no, we're gonna put you on a jeep. We're gonna take you back to an aid station. Oh, no, I don't wanna go back to an aid station. You're going back. They put me on a jeep hood and drove me back about a mile to the aid station. Got into the aid station and I was cussing up a streak, a blue streak at that. And the captain there said, listen young man, if you don't stop swearing, I won't look at you at all. I'll just let you lay. So that quieted me down and he looked at me at the le leg, he tore, tore open the, the uh, pant leg and uh, cut it open and uh, said, I can't do anything with this. We're going to put you, send you back to the uh, field hospital or to uh, evac hospital. An ambulance came, took me to an evac hospital about five miles back. I was, I was there one day and they never looked at me. Didn't have a chance to. A message came over the speaker system that the German lines, had the Germans had broken through our lines and were coming down the road that I had come down the day before and that we were going to have to they were going to have to drop the to the hospital tent and move out before the Germans could get there. Those of you, this is on the speaker system, those of you who can walk, start walking toward the road. The, re didn't say retreating, the, um, Anyhow, the, the uh, American soldiers that were withdrawing would pick you up, no doubt, just tell them you're from the hospital. So the boys started walking over there. They brought ambulances up for me and they, uh, the litter patients. Uh, and took us to Belgium while we were placed on the 
basketball floor of a high school gymnasium. It was covered and it was uh, staffed by Red Cross workers. It was covered with injured. They put me on a cot next to a guy who had crashed his fighter plane and he had been burned from head to foot and wrapped in gauze that they do when they burn them, I guess. And he smelled terrible, but they asked me to try to get some soup into the mouth hole so he could get some nourishment. It didn't work. I asked him what happened, and that's when he told me I crashed my plane. He says, I'll catch hell over that. <laughs> He's lucky if he made it. I don't think he made it. But nevertheless, uh, from there, we, I was sent, uh, uh, no, doctors, no doctors looked at me there. I was sent to a hospital in Paris. And there the doctors looked at me. The knee was swollen like a barrel, and uh, the only thing they did for me was to remove the uh, fluid from the knee sent me to a hospital in Cherbourg. From there I went back to England uh, to a hospital and there in England uh, one of my high school buddies that I played ball with came to see me and I was just so pleased that he had made the effort. He was stationed with the Air Force nearby and he saw my name in a, a wounded column in a newspaper and he came up to see me and uh, uh, I was uh, it buoyed me up I suppose but they couldn't do anything for me there either they put me on a hospital ship when a Queen Mary was made into a hospital ship and took me back across the ocean to America uh, we landed in New Jersey and from there I went from here to there and nobody did anything except each case several places they took uh, water out of the knee to uh, uh, try to get it back to a normal size it took me six months of hospitalization, treatment, and uh, um, what do they call it when they try to rehabilitate, rehabilitate you. Uh, I ended up and now I went to Memphis first and then back to Fort Percy Jones General in Michigan. And uh, from there, they told me, had a conference with a bunch of doctor officers, said, well, young man, we can't help you too much, but we can send you back to Fort Sheridan for some more rehab. I guess that's the story of Matt Matson. I'd like to think I've lived a good life.